in sports rap brian fulford and ad drew here we have come to the end of the regular season of the black college football season week number 14 has concluded and there's nothing left but a championship game a bowl game and the final debates as to who will be crowned as the black college football national champions AD, as as we come to the end of the season, uh, are, are there any uh, melancholy thoughts that cross your mind, or or what what kind of thoughts come through your mind as we prepare to put a bow on the football season? A couple of things, Brian. A is hoodie weather. You know, at the end of the football season, we've had Thanksgiving. Rivalry weekends, both on the uh, FBS level and the FCS level. It's time to pull out those heavy coats if you already haven't uh, pulled those out in the hoodies and the hats and the gloves and all that stuff. So the weather's going to change, number one. Number two, and probably a little bit more upbeat than the cold weather we're about to get, we're about to get into hoop season. You know, it, indoor sports are in vogue for the next uh, three months there, Brian. So, uh those are a couple of things uh, that the uh, end of the basketball, excuse me, end of the football season bring to me. And, you know, another year and hopefully some opportunities for some of our guys to get to the next level, be it uh, the NFL or one of the other professional leagues and make a living at this for the next few years. Wow, that's an interesting and warm, warm thought there, A.D. Uh, <laughs> um, my, uh, my thoughts really come to uh, what, what, um, what an interesting year it's been. I think we have seen, uh, and that's what's always interesting, every year kind of takes its own shape and form. I, I, I thought – Coming out of last year, we had so many top-notch returning players, but I really, I really don't think the story this year is about them. I think it's about some of the the newer names that kind of popped up, especially the names that popped up in relief. Uh, you know, the new names, uh, the, the guys who like Jamie Martin, uh, sort of a sort of a new name. Um, you know, his first full year starting. Um, the relief, the relief efforts of Felix Harper at Alcorn State and um, uh, Jerome Johnson at Bowie, um, you know, we had, uh, you know things like that, kind of, uh, you know, and then of course, you know, the slew of running backs that we had, we talked about on a few different occasions over at, uh, well, over in the CIAA. So uh, it, it, it's been, a, it's been a interesting year i guess I'll, I'll do a little bit of job of summarizing it uh later on here in the upcoming weeks as we as we prepare our final shows in which we kind of talk about the expectations we we will do a do sort of an end of the year kind of show where we go through every team in black college football and just kind of look at their uh projections from the beginning of the year and, and as the season ended, you know, did they meet expectation? Did they go above or below expectation? And, you know, no no grades. I mean, it's kind of uh, – we'll leave that to other folks. But uh, I, I think we can best summarize things up in, in those terms. 
So I want to remind you, if you are just catching our show for one of the first few times, uh, follow us on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And uh, at MyBCSN, the number one is the Black College Sports Network. Our personal Twitter feeds, uh, 80s is at BCSN Drew, D-R-E-W. Mine's is at DRB365. And always we want to encourage you to find our webpage, mybcsn.net, and find us on Facebook, our uh, Black College Sports Network page, and our uh, Sports Wrap page as well. And uh, so, AD, we had one main game this past weekend, and that was the Bayou Classic in New Orleans, Louisiana, between Southern and Grambling. Brian, it's New Orleans. That's how they say it down there, it's New Orleans. Not New okay. Orleans, New Orleans. I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Midwest I'm a Midwest farmer city boy, so I, I'll call it uh, – no, I can't even get that out. New Orleans. All right. New Orleans. Okay. It sounds horrible coming out of my mouth like that. Might have just drooled all over my, might have drooled all over my keyboard as I was saying that. So, uh, first off, have you have you ever been to the Bayou? That's uh, let me ask that first question of you. No, that's on that's on my bucket list, and uh, f- for that sponsor that, uh, out there that uh, wants to help uh, the Black College Sports Network get there next year, <laughs> please please feel free to tweet me or, or yeah, I, tweet, I, tweet Doctor B. I, I feel like so, I feel like we have to make a point of getting there. It's easy. It's so much easier for us to get to the Florida Classic, but really there's, there's nothing other than just us stopping us from getting to the Bayou, uh, especially yes. given that it's Thanksgiving week, or, you know, the, the weekend after the Thanksgiving day. So in terms of traveling on a Friday and getting there Saturday for the game, I, I feel like we just have to do this and just stop making excuses. So we'll just, we'll just put that on the calendar for 2020 uh, we'll just circle it as Bayou Classic 2020. Uh, we'll make sure to be there. And uh, after, after we talk about the game, uh, Ryan, I do have one point I want to bring up about uh, this particular weekend. We got to put that uh, in our and our pre show in our pre show notes. As it, as it relates to the game, as, as it just relates to the the weekend itself. Oh, I I think I know what you're going to tell. You're gonna you're gonna bring you're gonna bring us down. You're going to bring the show no. down with that, aren't you? No. <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> um, no, in all seriousness, yeah, no. Uh, I, I think I know where you're going with that. Uh, so, sure, yeah, we'll we'll make sure to to uh, talk about that uh, uh, at the end of uh, the game recap. But uh, the game recap, the game was, uh, was the game, and it, and it was a good game by all accounts. Um, what – a couple of things. I, you know, normally this game airs on NBC, on the main NBC channel. And I don't know if this is the first year, maybe this is the first year I noticed it, but this time it was on the NBC Sports Network, which is usually you can find it on your cable network, or if you're a streamer like me, a cord cutter, then you can obviously download the NBC Sports Network app and you can watch it there. Um, you know, and I, I don't know. Did, did did that did that catch you? Did you notice that at all this year? Or yeah, yeah, uh, I I did notice it because I've always been able to watch it on network TV, and kind of just out of habit, I went to the NBC channel on in my area and I don't even I think there was another game on and I so I went to the uh I had direct TV. I had no problem saying it so I just like let me just, let me see if this on the NPC Sports Network channel and, and there it was. Mm-hmm. So it, it it was it was a little bit different. I wonder if that's a downgrade in the in the game because of the ratings. Or was it just one of those? There was another big FCS game on at that same time, and the uh, Bayou Classic got bumped. Just and the, just and curious. the game was actually the game was actually a 5 p.m. Eastern kickoff for Central Time, where so you know it was four o'clock kicking off in that area, which was also a little bit later. Uh, I, I believe this game 
in the past has been more of a 2 o'clock Eastern time kind of game, you know, maybe a 1 o'clock kickoff in uh, in central time zone. So that was another thing that kind of struck me with the game being late. But by all accounts, it had no effect on the attendance numbers. Uh, I saw there were 68,300-plus in attendance for the game, which was, is pretty damn good. Um, you know, That's I, good I for any level of football, Brian. Oh, yeah. I mean, given some of the – Given some of the uh, rivalries that were taking taking place this weekend, um, this one just see you know and again just cemented where this game is and you know what the the brand. It, it, there's a reason why the SWAC has not forfeited, or it's a reason why the SWAC forfeited playing in the FCS playoffs. Because this game means so much to the conference from a brand-wise, uh, from a brand standpoint, and just from all the exterior things that went on, playing them, you can't you can't duplicate that in the playoffs. And then with the risk of you having to play one or who knows, you have to play three to four games just to win a championship. Um, and then the numbers, the numbers won't. You're not you're not even going to get close to sixty-eight thousand people for these playoff games. So I I totally get it why the SWAC is not – and nobody from Grambling or Southern is going to move this game off this weekend. Um, so uh, props to uh, props to those uh, – to the SWAC. Uh, but all right, so let's get into the ball game. Um, just starting off in the, in the first half a little bit, uh, you know, obviously, the, you know, the final score is – what it is. I mean, Southern would end up coming from behind, grabbing a lead, and then holding off Grambling with uh, with essentially a blocked field goal on the final play of the game. Or was it the final play? Or maybe it was the, it was the final play for Grambling. It was a blocked field goal that 30-28 uh, to 28 would be the final score for Southern. But, you know, going back through the first half of the ball game, um, Gram, uh, Grambling jumped out to a 21 to 3 lead <clears throat> as early as middle of the second quarter and I you know I had been a I had told a couple people I thought Southern I thought Grambling would win this game by more than a touchdown and I, and so everything that I thought about this game seemed to be going going my direction in terms of my analysis <laughs> in the first mm, quarter and a half uh, and then kind of things changed at well, maybe about five minutes left in the first half, A.D., as, as Southern picked up a couple of big, huge plays. And they really – it seemed like they turned Ladarius Skelton loose a little bit. Um, you know, he found he, – he had a great connection in the ball game with uh, Hunter Register. Uh and and the and Hunter Register and uh, Ladarius Skelton really seem to connect in this ball game in a in a big way. But you noticed something it was we were talking pre pre show after Grambling scored first. You thought a big turning point in the ball game was Southern unable to come up with a touchdown to tie it at seven, and they were forced to settle uh, at seven three. Correct? Yeah, yeah that was correct. Uh, some way, I want to say it was mid to late first quarter, Brian. Southern had the ball first and goal as they they had got stopped just short of the uh, of the goal line uh, at at the one foot line, and I believe that was may have been on a third down run uh, previously. They got stopped at the one foot line, and next thing the next thing you know, four plays later. It's forced is forced and goal from like the four yard line. Southern has gone backwards on the, on their three the three uh, plays that they had. Uh, I remember it, it was they lost two yards on the first play and just kind of it went south from there. And I thought that was a big goal line stand by Grambling, and it kind of seemed to be the story of the first half. Southern was unable to run the ball effectively against Grambling in the first half, especially when they needed to, Brian. 
Yeah, and, and what you're talking about is uh, one of uh, you're talking about the third possession for Southern in the uh, in the contest and uh, the third possession in which essentially was a ten play drive and they got it all the way down to the uh, Grambling one yard line after a uh, skeleton eight yard run. It got it to the Grambling one. And then on second down, they had a loss of one yard. On third down, Skelton got stopped for nowhere, uh, for no game. And so they ended up kicking what was a 19-yard field goal. Um, so, I mean, like you said, a big win right there at that moment for uh, for Grambling uh, to, to avoid giving up the uh, giving up the the early uh, touchdown that would have tied the game up. Um, moving into the second quarter, the second quarter is where all the fireworks were. You had a total of 28 points scored in the first in the second quarter, and that's really where the momentum of this game changed because um, Grambling uh, would actually get two touchdowns and 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 in almost consecutive plays or consecutive series. Uh, they would first score uh, C.J. Russell. Would, uh, would have a 27-yard touchdown run with 9.30 remaining. And then uh, Miguel Mendez would uh, fire off a onside kick, uh, which was actually recovered uh, by Grambling, uh, recovered by uh, Cash Foley at the Southern 24-yard line. So right after scoring, you know, Coach Fobbs calls up the onside, you know, sort of the Sean Payton of the New Orleans Saints in the Super Bowl, calls up the onside kick unexpectedly, caught Southern off guard, I'm sure. And uh, on the on the uh, fumble, Gramley gets it on the 24-yard line, and then in a matter of three plays, they're able to uh, score a touchdown. Obviously, the big play in the drive was a – uh, Keelan Elder, a 23-yard run, which basically got all the way down to the southern one-yard line, and then Elder punched it in. And just like that, with 8.45, it was Grambling 21, Southern 3. So definitely they had scored those two touchdowns in a matter of, uh, let me do the math here, probably less than a minute, you know, 45, uh, 45 seconds, two touchdowns within 45 seconds. Uh, but Southern came right back and answered and, and, and give some credit to Ladarius Skelton. I thought, you know, one of the things I talked about AD and I was curious, or, you know, uh, Coach Odom stuck with Ladarius Skelton in this ball game. He didn't go with the two quarterbacks like I thought he might. He stuck with Skelton the whole game. Do you think that kind of made a, a difference as the game went on? Were you a little bit surprised by – just seeing Skelton in the whole game, given sort of the up and down nature of the season he's had. Well, you know, doing a championship game, Brian, in my opinion, is not the time to to ch- to change change what you have been doing. You've been playing two quarterbacks for a bulk of the year. Why, why change it now? Yes, uh, I understand the quote unquote hot hand. If if you have a hot hand, but even still, familiar, the familiarity of what this team has been doing, you know, I don't know if if it was pressure of the, of the big game or what, but you, this is not the time of the year to change which, what's been working. Um, so, yeah, on, after, you know, with the score 21 to 3, um, you know, Ladarius Skelton – settles in and takes Southern on a 12-play, 75-yard drive, which results in a touchdown. The, the the big play of the ball game came on a second and 11 from the Grambling 42-yard line, and that's when Ladarius Skelton, I believe from the – now he was on the left hash mark. If you can imagine, you know, you're driving – you know, towards your opponent's goal line, you're on the left hash mark, and he tosses a pass 39 yards to Cameron McKay um, on the far right side. I mean, it was a beautiful ball and even a better catch by McKay. 
It was set up a four-yard scoring pass from Skelton to Hunter Register, and Southern was right on the board with uh, with their first touchdown in the ball game, and the score at that point was uh, 21, uh, 21 to nine. Um, Twenty-one to ten would be the score after the um, uh, after the PAT. Grambling came right back on the next possession. And, you know, starting from their own 20, marched it right down the field in about six plays, six or seven plays. Uh, Jeremy Hickbottom with a couple of nice pass completions. Uh, Keelan Elder with a 25-yard run on the drive. And they would get all the way down to the southern uh, 29-yard line. And Miguel Mendez came out for his first field goal, a 46-yard field goal that would go wide right. And when I say it went wide right, A.D., it went, it went wide right. Oh man, it went wide right by about ten yards wide right. So and make, make all those Florida State misses look good. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I had tweeted something wide, and I just put a bunch of eyes. Just wide right. Uh, so that was that was enough. That, now remember, that's the first of what would be three special teams plays, which. Any one of those three plays go well for, for Grambling, they win this ball game. But that was the first one that went bad for them there in the second quarter. Uh, they left, let's see, they left 50 seconds on the clock for Southern, uh, who picked up at their own 29-yard line. And uh, I'm looking for, let's see, big plays here again. How about another big play from uh, Skelton to Hunter Register for 38 yards, moving from the uh, southern 47-yard line all the way down to the Gramley 15-yard line. Um, you know, so, the, again, this is where you start to see we've been – a lot of people have been critical of Skelton and his passing, but he really showed up and showed out in this ball game with his passing skills <clears throat> as he hit that 38-yarder to Register. <clears throat> and then he would come back and hit a couple more passes, get all the way down to the – Four yard line, and this is this is where I thought things got interesting. On a uh, first and goal from the four, Skelton throws a pass to uh, Ben, uh, the the running back, for about three yards. He tried to get out of bounds, but he wasn't able to. So, you know, Southern is rushing to try to get to the uh, get to the ball and and get a quick snap or a, a quick spike, and Grambling ended up jumping off sides. You know, you thought that maybe there was a turnover, and you were going to say, oh, my God, why didn't Southern just go for the field goal? Well, you know, Grambling ends up making a big mistake, jumps off sides, gives Southern an opportunity, and at that point there's one second left on the clock. And this is, this is what I thought. This was the first key play of the ball game. And we talk about coaching decisions, A.D. This was the first key coaching decision that I thought Olson, uh, Dawson Odom's got right, and this is why he won. And unfortunately, some, some calls later on by uh, Broderick Fobbs didn't go right in Grambling loss. He decided to go for it. Now, you know, one second left, you really only have one play left. And I was a little shocked. I was like, oh, they're not kicking a field goal. They're going for it. And literally it was just, you know, uh, a, a quarterback dive <clears throat> right over um, – or not a quarterback dive, but a halfback dive uh, from Sims, uh, running back who would who would have a big game in, in this contest. Um, and and Southern goes into halftime with a 21-17 uh, – trailing Grambling, excuse me, 21-17. to 17, And essentially, A.D., they should have been down 21-13. to 13. And if you add in the other points that they left on the field, you know, that I think, you know, it makes, it makes me think that that going for it right there was sort of the makeup for that earlier play in the first. What are your thoughts on how that first or that second quarter ended? Um, it, not, not that I was watching another game, Brian, but I was watching another game. And uh, you know, I, was channel, I was channel surfing. And during the Auburn Alabama game, something sim- similar happened where Auburn was given one second on the clock with uh 
the thought the clock had ran out. The uh, the the Darius Whitlow ran the ball. They said his forward progress was stopped with one second on the clock. They reviewed the play and put the one second back on the clock. Auburn was able to snap the ball uh, with the, on the ready for play and kick a field goal. That was the difference in that game. Auburn won that game by three points. Ironic, in, in this game also, if that field goal gets off, we're looking we'll, – we'll, how how much should we lose that game by, Brian? Did Graham lose that game by? Lost by two. That 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 one play with one second makes a difference. If people say one second doesn't make a difference, it just ask the people from 2011 with the kick six, does one second make a difference? And a field, yeah, goal, to with, a field goal to tip with one second remaining on the clock. You've, you've got to get points whenever you can get points. You don't want to be chasing points, especially late in a game, in a rivalry game, in a, and in a game that is that close at that point in time. If if they were up three scores at that point in time, I, I understand trying to put that deal in the coffee. But at that point in time, You've got you've got to get the, you've got to get those three points, Brian. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, we're talking. You know, you go from a twenty-one seventeen. You, you could have been looking at twenty-one thirteen versus uh, twenty-one seventeen. So you know, credit that was a that was a big play at that point. Uh, moving into the third quarter, Southern took their first lead of the ball game with four forty left in the third quarter. It seemed like both defenses kind of uh, really exerted their wills early. Uh, until Southern went on a 13-play, 77-yard drive uh, and scored their first touchdown with or grabbed their first lead, excuse me, with 440 left in the third quarter. Uh, Ladarius Skelton found the Hunter Register again for his second touchdown, and it turned out to be uh, Register's seventh consecutive game with at least one touchdown. And and so that's a nice little streak that's happening right there before our eyes, and that'll be a key one to watch for Southern heading into the SWAG championship game. But uh, Southern Southern had grabbed uh, the lead and, um, you know, and, 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 in, and in true – uh, fat, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find the stats because I, I want to make sure I say this right. This was with 440 left there at the end. Um, Southern Graham, actually Grambling would take over uh, and pretty much run out the quarter and then head into the fourth quarter with, and this was, you know, Grambling's answer with a nice drive. And again, if you're thinking, Grambling's going to win this ball game. This drive that that they're currently on is is that is your is your argument. I mean, you're sitting there. Southern had just grabbed the lead for the first time in the ball game. The momentum seemed to be in their favor, but then here comes Grambling on what would be an 11 play, 75 yard drive, and with Jeremy Hickbottom would score a touchdown, and so 14:56, Southern is now trailing. So Southern went from leading to all of a sudden now they're down uh, 28 to 24. 28 to 24 at this point in the ball game in the fourth quarter. Um, Southern would come right back, though, and this is, uh, you know, this is where you start to see, okay, are the defenses getting tired or maybe has the offense has picked up something because Southern uh, with a, uh, with a nice return, a 23 yard return uh, that put the ball back at the Southern 26. They had two nice runs uh, by, let me make sure I get Mr. Sims, name correct by Jared Sims, who's a freshman running back, you know, so you talk about stepping up, at, in, in big plays at the right time, uh, Jared Sims uh, on the first carry of the of this ensuing drive, he gets a 23-yard run, gets all the way down to the Southern 49-yard line. Then there's a pass interference call. So then tack on 15 on the very next play, as guess what? Skelton was going to guess who? Hunter Register. 
there's a pass interference, 15 yards, botch the ball at the Grambling 36-yard line now. And then back to Sims, one play, 36 yards, a nice run. You almost, you know, in the two runs that Sims had on this drive, they were almost read options. Uh, well, they were read options, and it just it seemed like it caught Grambling off guard. It was an interesting time to see Grambling get caught off guard uh, by by what just happened. And so uh, the touchdown score goes to Southern. And now, granted, hey, we've seen three drives, three scores, two lead. Let me see. Did I say that? How many lead changes do we have? One, two, three lead changes. You know, so all of a sudden the game is getting exciting with um, uh, with 14-11 left to play. Graham, Southern has a 30-28 to 28 lead. Uh, the PAT was blocked. And that was a big key. A big special teams play by Grambling as they're the ones who got the block. And, um, you know, because who knows that we, as we'll see later, that that one point <laughs> could very well have been what cost Southern the victory. Grambling comes right back on the ensuing drive. Again, talking about the defenses being gassed. Grambling goes on 11 play, 42 yard drive. And this is the second special teams uh, and actually I got a question what happened here Southern has the ball uh, Gramley has the ball at the Southern 26 yard line Jeremy Hickbottom takes a horrible sack AD a seven yard loss from a 26 yard line to drop uh, drop Gramley all the way back to the 33 and now at this point what would have been a 43 yard field goal had, had Hickbottom been where he was at turns into a 50-yard field goal. And, you know, at this – hey, look, there's still uh, nine-something nine minutes remaining in the ball game. I got a question Coach Fobbs' decision to kick a 50-yard field goal instead of possibly pooch punting. What do you think of the decision at this point in the ball game to go for the 50-yard field goal attempt, which, by the way, O is blocked? Oh. Uh. At that point in time in the game, Brian, the defenses had pretty much uh, – they were pretty much left in the locker room. The defenses had not done anything in in the second half of that game. These, these are one of those defenses, and now you're at the point where both teams are chasing points at that point in time in the game also, Brian. So I understand going for it. And on a, and I'm gonna say this. This is a big if. If this is within your kicker's range, let's be real, Brian. Most HBCUs do not have a kicker who can go 50 percent from beyond 50. So I would have been nervous yeah. with Mendez. He had just missed a 41 yarder wide right. You know, yeah. so now you're sending him out there to kick 50. That's a lot of confidence that. Coach Fobbs has in the in the young Mr. Mendez. Yeah, you know that's the thing that that's the, the one thing I question because well we're not even most HBCUs most schools period do not have a kicker who is who you would have true confidence in beyond fifty yards. So that's what I que- that that's why I kind of agree with you on questioning that call, Brian. You know, 50 yards, I mean, if it, let's be real. If he hits it, he, 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 he's the hero. It's the difference in the game. He looks like, uh, looks like a great coaching decision. Hey, you got confidence in your, lo- in your, in your kicker. But he does it. Now he, he, that kick pop, could possibly be sitting him in the same position as the Virginia Union head coach. Right, right. Uh, So, again, that field goal attempt from the Southern 33 is blocked as a 50-yard field goal attempt. uh, Gives the ball right back to uh, Southern um, at the at their own at their own 33-yard line, and Southern would essentially go on a similar drive. It's amazing how long these drives were at this point in the ball game, they would go on a 10-play drive, only really chew up about 29 yards, but they did chew up some time, uh, a lengthy drive, which chewed up some time, maybe about six minutes a time or so. But they got all the way down to the Grambling 38. And instead of going for it, 
you know, it was fourth and 18. They chose to, uh, they, they chose to, add, well, actually, no, let me take that back. They got it all the way down to the Grambling 33 yard line. And so we're almost talking the same spot that we are, the same spot, different in the field, where Coach Fobbs went for the field goal. And this time, Coach Odoms, with the two point lead, decided to take a five yard penalty, move back five yards, and a pooch punt it. Ball went out of bounds. You know, I think uh, a couple of Southern players got close to got close to it, but uh, they weren't able to down it inside the uh, five yard line. So ball goes out of bounds. Southern start or Grambling starts from their own twenty. I thought that was an interesting moment, another coaching moment. We can call that a win for Odoms, Coach Odoms. You know, if, if you look at it in this game in retrospect. You're thinking, hey, that's a smart coaching play uh, with the lead. And, you know, it's uh, – who knows? You know, maybe you do certain things with the lead that you don't do when you don't have the lead. And so maybe right. it, it was just as simple as that for Coach Fobbs versus Coach Odoms. But it's just the irony of both men having their teams in similar situation. One, instead of instead of Fobbs trying to pin Southern – you know, inside the five, Southern takes advantage of trying to pin Grambling inside the five. And, you know, even though it was a touchback, it's still just interesting, I thought, at that moment of the game. Uh, 257 you know, remaining. You know, you know, yeah, you know Brian, my last thought on that, when you're that close, when you're inside the 35-yard line uh, and, and you're in a fourth down situation, even with taking the penalty, you punting the ball th- – th- they come out to the 20th, the ball goes into the end zone. You're almost better just going for it, Brian, because even if you go for it and you wind up short, what's four or five yards going to make uh, make a difference at that point in time in the game, Brian? I'd rather, right. I'd rather go for it, take my chance, and get that first down, even if I throw a screen pass or run a draw and still wind up short. Hey, they're inside the 30 if, if I pick up four or five yards on this play. It's, if, if you've got any confidence in your defense, it's not really going to make a difference, those four or five yards. Right, right. No, I, I hear you 100% on that. Um, so two uh, – let's see. We've got about two – 257 remaining in the ball game. Grambling takes over on their own 20 yard line. And this becomes the Jeremy Hickbottom. You got to pass us. You got to pass. You got to make the plays and get us out of this situation. You got to march us down the field and get a field goal. Uh, he did make some, some great plays and decisions. Uh, he was faced with a third and three, came up with an 18 yard completion to push the ball to the Grambling 45 yard line. Uh, then he was faced with a third and 10, completed a nine-yard pass to get to the southern 34-yard line. And then on fourth and one, uh, Hickbottom gets a two-yard run for the first down, um, then would go uh, an incompletion and then find a nine-yard completion, which pushed the ball all the way down to the 23-yard line. So we're at the 23-yard line. Uh, tick, 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 clock, 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 coming up underneath a minute, actually under 30 seconds at this point. Um, third and one, Ick bottom passes, incomplete, <clears throat> which stops the clock. And now we have a fourth and one at the southern 23-yard line. So just imagine, I mean, in a, in two minutes and 40-something seconds, Ick bottom took Grambling from their own 20 all the way down to the southern 23-yard line with 10 seconds remaining. And at this point, you know, it's fourth and one. Uh, Grambling or southern, excuse me, took a couple of timeouts. Uh, They send a field goal kicker out. Miguel Mendez, who is 0 for 2, he missed one from 41 wide right. He had another one blocked. And so here he comes out, his third field goal attempt. Uh, to essentially, this would win the game. I mean, Southern had a couple of timeouts in their pocket. They definitely tried to use them <clears throat> to ice the kicker. And uh, in, in true Bayou Classic, you'll remember this for years to come, and, and, and folks will talk about this. <clears throat> They'll talk about the block heard around the world as uh, Southern special teams 
breaks through the line, gets a block, and pretty much secures the victory <clears throat> for the uh, for the 46th Bayou Classic, as uh, Southern would take a knee, and that would be that would be all she wrote. And Southern gets their second consecutive win in a row, and just a brutal way to lose for Grambling. I mean, you <clears throat> you know, obviously. <laughs> Uh, yesterday was just or Saturday was a was a tremendous day in college football in just some of the games, but uh, there there is there can't be a worse there aren't too many worse feelings than losing a game the way <clears throat> Grambling uh, lost this ball game. Um, Ad, this was a, this was pretty much an even ball game. I mean, you know, statistically, <clears throat> uh, first downs were about even, twenty one to twenty. Uh, rushing yards were even, uh, Southern 208, Grambling 209. Uh, passing yards, Southern 181, Grambling 155. Low penalties, uh, Southern only had three penalties for 15 yards. Grambling, four penalties for 21. Southern did make one turnover. Grambling didn't make any turnovers, but they had, you know, special teams. I mean, two block kicks and a miss. I mean, those were those were – any one of those are made, and I mean theoretically, you could say, eh, you know, <laughs> Grambling wins this ball game. Um, just an outstanding ball game all the way around. And I mean, so Southern Southern knocks uh, Grambling uh, ends their ends their uh, puts an end to their six game winning streak. Uh, Southern uh, moves to seven and four. And Grambling falls to six and five, and really Grambling season just ends on sort of a thud. I mean, it just was an average season. They were on the verge, I thought, of doing something great, uh, heading into the potentially the SWAC championship game. But after you lose, people kind of forget about you, and all they'll see in the end is that you were six and five, one game over five hundred. No one will care about how it started or the middle or the end. They'll just look at it and say, "Oh, you were six and five. Eh. <laughs> your your thoughts on uh, on the end of this ball game and, and Southern and Grambling there? Just 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 a depending on which side you you're on, it's either an unfortunate uh, uh, ending or a tremendous ending. Just depends on what side just uh, the uh, Superdome you were sitting on, mm-hmm. but. For the fans who were there, the 68,000 fans in the Superdome, what a great game. That, what more do you want for it to come down to the last play of the game, Brian? That's that's what you could ask for in a rivalry game. We, we saw it uh, a week ago in Orlando, Florida. Came down to the yeah. last minute of the came down to the last minute of the game. Yeah, you hate if if you're a Grambling fan, you hate when your team loses. But hey, you got your money's worth out of that game. You 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 got your money's worth. Yes, you can go play the what if game, but what a great game. There's no, there's no better way to put it. Yeah, well said. I mean that you know, and again from October, uh, from October all the way up until that point. Your, your guys were playing some good ball. So Grambling was playing some good ball. Just, I just hated for him. Uh, another bad prediction by your boy. Uh, who did you go with? Did you have Southern in this game? Yeah, well, we, 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 we in this one together, Brian. We oh, okay. Together so we were in, this one. And, and, yeah, even the computer, the uh, sports simulator, I think had predicted Grambling 25 to 20. You know, one thing that the computer analytics can't predict, it can't predict missed field goals and blocked field goals, just to, just to point that out, right? It can't predict that. Yeah, yeah yes, you're absolutely correct <laughs> on that, Brian. You know, that and turnovers is the one, is the one thing that the computer simulator does not seem to uh, pick up on. <laughs> right. Uh, so we now move forward. Southern advances to the Cricket Wireless SWAC Championship game. For the second consecutive year, they would travel to Norman, Mississippi, to play Alcorn State, who, I mean, is the uh, is the epitome of the thorn in the side. I mean, we know Coach Odoms has this great record against every other SWAT team. He just they just have not been able to beat Alcorn State uh, in the now eight year 
term for Odoms. Um, they have lost, I think, eight of – no, probably now it's nine of the last ten after the regular season contest that they lost. So, I mean, Alcorn host, they're going to be a favorite, I'm sure. I haven't seen any lines. That game, it'll be interesting to see. You know, this is a game that a year ago, AD, um, I thought late in the ball game, we, it was explosive first first quarter. Uh, things kind of settled. And then as the game went on, Ladarius Skelton really – made an impact in the ball game to the point where he did get injured or had a soft tissue injury, I believe, in early, late third quarter, early fourth quarter, which really slowed Southern down. Because I think he was really having his way with Alcorn. And had he not gone out of the ball game for, I think, one or two series, uh, who knows what would happen. Because I think when he went out, it was a three-point ball game, turned out to be an 11 11- uh, 10 or 11 point ball game uh, by the time he came back and that was sort of a an X factor in the outcome of the ball game so it'll be interesting to see if he stays healthy uh, and of course you know Alcorn won a previous matchup with a great second half performance um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that but just uh, any general reactions or thoughts to the uh, SWAC championship game. You don't, you don't have to go too detailed if you don't want. Once again, Lorman, Mississippi, Brian. Oh, don't you start. Don't do it. Don't do it. I was surprised at the attendance numbers last year. Uh, right. Ho- hopefully we, they get good attendance again this year. You know, I, I really kind of like the way that the SWAC handles their championship game. Uh, hosted it on, on campus, on site of the team with the best overall record in the conference. I, I really do like that format. It, it, it gave Alcorn something to play for last week, where if it would have been a East-West format, Alcorn had right. nothing to play for last week, which made that game against Jackson State even more important for them. That's right. Yeah, Alcorn finished the overall uh, season eight and three, Southern seven and four, and yeah, like you said, had that had it been uh, already predetermined that the winner of the West was going to host, yeah, I mean, who knows? Alcorn would have probably rested some guys against Jackson State, but they they were uh, determined to uh, win that uh, win that ball game. Yeah, either East or West, because. Even if if the West wins it, hey, Alcorn knows that, that they're on the road. If the East hosts it, Alcorn knows they're at home. So either way, Alcorn would have rested players, but no, they had to go and play ball this past weekend. Right, yeah. Um, I was going to look and see if I can do – I'm looking down here, quick little ratings. I'm on a page that does ratings. I'm trying to see if there's any ratings numbers from the game. Um, nothing that I'm nothing that I'm coming across. I'll probably have to do a little little digging to kind of see what the ratings were <laughs> from that uh, from the Grambling um, Southern game. But um, all right, so yeah, let, let's move on. Let's move on. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of get into uh, talking about the SWAG championship a little bit later. Um, one of the things I did want to make sure to give you time to talk about AD was, uh, I, and I know you probably want to bring this up, and I figure now is a good time to do that at this point in the show. Um, the weekend was sort of – the great weekend was marred uh, by um, – a tragedy, to say the least. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll let you kind of expand. I'm assuming that's what you wanted to talk on, correct? I, actually, that's not where I was going, so I'm going to let you go, go on that first. Oh, well, no, no. No, my God. Uh, see, that's what I get for I was trying to keep us related to this. So I, okay, so I stepped all over it. I mean, was it related to, this, to the uh, Bayou Classic or the – no, it, it not 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 directly related to the Bayou Classic, but it is uh, related to uh, our Thanksgiving weekend of football, Brian. Um, 
you remember when we were in school, the Florida Classic used to be played uh, this same weekend on, on the same day. And there were a few other classics in the BAC that were played after Thanksgiving instead of pre-Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. I know the the MEAC, uh fam, you was fam, you were doing with the last holdouts. They moved the game to the weekend before the uh, Thanksgiving so that they would be eligible to go to the to the playoffs. With mm-hmm. these with these two conferences locked into the Celebration Bowl, do you think it may be wise for the MEAC to start playing games once again? on the Saturday, the Friday, or the Saturday after Thanksgiving, Brian. Uh, and I'm thinking of the the the, the Florida Classic, the, uh, the the Aggie Eagle Classic as another one. Those are just two that happened in the BCAC that I think would be, uh, would be great to play the weekend after Thanksgiving now instead of the BCAC having – almost four weeks off before the BAC champion plays in the Celebration Bowl. Your opinion on that, Brian? Um, hmm. Great question. I Well, you know, I heard it I heard it discussed I saw a post by somebody that had asked the question, is it time for the MEAC to consider having a championship game? Um, and my my thought to that was, given the fact that everybody in the MEAC, there's only nine teams, everybody plays everybody. Now, if you wanted to ensure or avoid potentially having two or multiple conference champions, then – you know, having a having your one versus two play each other after the round robin of everyone playing at least one, I could get it. But my only problem is, you know, now you've officially taken yourselves out of the MEAC uh, or the playoff hunt because, like, again, I find no reason other than a little bit of bias that South Carolina State should not have been given an opportunity to play in the playoffs. Whereas the school that I thought bumped them, which was a independent FCS school, North Dakota, lost lost. I mean, by probably about two plus touchdowns in the opening round of the playoffs, they had a lesser record in South Carolina State and probably didn't even beat nearly the competition that South Carolina State played. Um, so I, I I don't know you know to answer your question fully AD I I, I don't have a, a quick answer for that I I do know what seems to have worked for the MEAC in this Celebration Bowl run is the fact that they do have this extra time off because they essentially have four weeks off before the Celebration Bowl whereas the SWAT really will only have two weeks off so it's you know in the five years of the Celebration Bowl the MEAC has won four of them. Uh, or, or excuse me, three of the four. Um, it seems to be, you know, maybe just, I don't know if it's just a better team or whether the rest has helped the better team get healthy. Um, but I think that's a positive, that I would be cautious about changing if I'm the MEAC. You know, I, I would just be cautious about changing it, you know. Um yeah, so I, I I really don't have a good answer for you, AD. I, I don't know I don't know if there's a, a, a strong enough need to want to uh to, to, to want to change and have that game after Thanksgiving. Um uh, what what's your thought on that? What what do you think should happen here? Well I I I'm I'm just I I, I think <clears throat> I think it would be good for the B Act to be doing something during during this weekend after um a, a, after Thanksgiving. Some way, somehow, I, I just think that they need to uh that that there needs to be uh, there needs to be other action. 
That, 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 that's, that's the why? best, that's the why? best way. Why? Do you, why? why e- what, e- what do you e- think e- is e- missing e- from e- them e- not e- playing? Either a, either a BAC championship game or something. The BAC gets lost. The BAC gets lost in the shuffle. If you're not going to go to the playoffs, if the BAC is going to continually get shut out of the playoffs, why not create another revenue stream by having a, a BAC championship game and or moving the moving our classics back to the post Thanksgiving? Just but see, I wonder: to, Are you creating? Are you creating another expense, or are you actually really creating a revenue stream? Because that that it sounds like you may just be creating another expense by having an additional week. I'm pre- I'm, I'm pretty sure just like Cricket Wireless came in and has sponsored the SWAT Championship game, there is another company. Uh, you know, T-Mobile, Total Wireless, some somebody who can come in and sponsor a MEAC champion, a MEAC championship game. Uh, I, I would just be just as apt to go to Orlando, Florida, the weekend after Thanksgiving, just as I am the weekend before Thanksgiving. I would be just as apt to go to the Aggie Eagle Classic the weekend after Thanksgiving as I am the weekend before Thanksgiving. You know, Alabama State moved away from Turkey Day, the Turkey Day Classic, being on Thanksgiving for for a few years there. They moved it to the Saturday before Thanksgiving. They That did not work for them. They found out that their attendance was better when they played that game on Thanksgiving. just becomes a part of the Thanksgiving holiday tradition for our families. So that, well, that's, 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 why I, that's why I bring that up. That's why I ask that question. And, no, I do not have the answer, but that's why, that's why we're here on shows like this, just to bring this discussion up to, to various people. Yeah, no, I, look, I – I, I guess I, I've never I've never thought of it, and you know I've just maybe accepted the the end of the season when it is. Um, but I've also sort of kept in the back of my mind the whole possibility of somebody getting into the playoffs as well. But um, you know if 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 our teams aren't going to get the consideration, <clears throat> then you are correct. Then there needs to be a willingness to want to play uh, some games the week of after Thanksgiving. Um, Yeah, yeah, I I could see that happening. Um, I got to get some more thought to that. I want to kind of look at some numbers in attendance. Like what was the attendance of the Turkey Day Classic in uh, uh, for Alabama State? You know, what was the attendance – between them and Prairie View, uh, that, that should have been a good attended, a well attended ball game, because Prairie View has a dynamic offense. They're worth going out and seeing, you know. But if you tell me that all, that less than ten thousand people showed up, I, is that really worth it? But that, that game usually draws in the twenties. The only thing that I don't like about the uh, them playing Prairie View is is just the just the distance, Brian. The the only way a game like that would well, who's the, work. Who's the alternative? Who would the alternative well, be? Well, let me finish. The only the only way a game like that works is if the team that they are playing is within a what I call you know what I like to call that four hour radius, Brian, where people are willing mm-hmm. to 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 drive up. Uh, a team like a, a Jackson State, uh, they played Mississippi Valley State last year in a game that was, that was well attended. Those would be the two teams out of the SWAC that would be good candidates for a game with on on Thanksgiving for an, an, an Alabama State. You know, obviously you're not going to touch the uh, Magic City Classic because it is what it is. Uh, and if we're just talking strictly SWAC matchups, the next two closest teams are Mississippi Valley State and Jackson State, Ryan. Hmm. Uh, I'm just looking at the box score here from that Prairie View A&M Alabama State game. 15,252 is the listed attendance 
And that that's that's probably that's probably due to the opponent. Preview, huh? I I figure Preview yeah. would would be. I mean, Preview is a good team. Preview, you know. You, but, so you're just saying in but, terms of Preview but, travel. Preview, Texas is how far from Montgomery, Alabama. I I think you're going to have that issue for any for most fan bases. I think. I'm, you know, don't quote me on it. Don't hold me to it. But I, I just think most fan bases are going to have that um, have that trepidation going on the road on Thanksgiving Day. Um, yeah, but uh, I don't know. You know, you they they say you, you you go where your team goes. You go and support your team. I mean, hell, everyone else travels, um, so you can make it work. You make it work, I guess. Uh, but, I, hey, what now, if Alabama State could play, it's so hard. See, it makes it makes me wonder, well, no, you can't do the Tuskegee. Tush- He's already made a commitment. I was going to say, that's the other part is the fact that it's the, the fact that you have the playoffs involved. It almost has to be a conference opponent. Um, right. Tuskegee and Miles are not going to come because they're going to go to the yeah. playoffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, those, those, those are the other two. The, your your, uh, your Gulf South teams are not going to come because they want to go to the playoffs. Right. So, right. I mean, yeah, they, you're, unless you're kinda... you go unless you go play Virginia Lynchburg, you know, no, it's not gonna no, work. Stop, it. stop <laughs> it! All respect to those guys. No, no, no. Stop it. Let's cut. The, let's cut that one. Let's cut that one short right there. <laughs> Um, all right, and, and I guess the, the other thing that I sort of started to mention that wasn't what you wanted to talk about was there was a shooting that took place in the uh, French Quarter the Saturday night after the Bayou real, I guess it, you say late, early, late, early Sunday morning, late Saturday night. Um, you know, I saw the numbers. There were, I don't think these were fatalities. I think these were just you know, injuries. Um, I did not read full story coverage. So I'm not going to get into talking about details. I will say it's just disappointing to hear um, about uh, about something like this taking place in, in a festive environment like uh, New Orleans and where you have Mardi Gras and, and you have other big events hosted it, it just uh, it, it just soils the reputation, but I think I think we're moving to a point in this world where we're no longer surprised, and I don't think we can target this and say, "Oh, hey, when these folks get together, violence erupts." I, it, I think we're past that because of we've seen tragedies happen in other events at other festivals and concerts and <clears throat> sadly at sporting events. So uh, I, I would just, um, it's just an unfortunate story. And I, I hope, you know, and I hope I pray that any, anybody hurt is able to survive and, and, and walk away uh, from whatever it is may have them in the hospital. And so, um, hope uh, you know. Well, I'll just leave it at that. I'll, I'll close with that. With that final thought. Q Time is a classic Atlanta soul food restaurant located in the historic West End. Q Time Soul Food is a family business started by Fred and Christine Crenshaw. Come on in, relax, and sink your chops into our tantalizing, mouth-watering, distinctive soul food with a twist. The Q Time way. 1120 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard or call your order in at 404-758-2881. Do you miss your mama's cooking? Then come on down to Q Time, an Urban Passport member. You know, the real reason why I went after uh, Comcast and Charter, it didn't even have it didn't have anything to do with my cable networks. It didn't. What happened was uh, a gentleman wanted to do the Black College Sports Network in partnership with the HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And Comcast did not accept it. And that would have made a lot of money 
for these black colleges. Absolutely. And it would have educated the Black College Sports Network. This is what he wanted to do. That would have educated a lot of black kids. And when they didn't do that, that's when I came off the bench and said, okay, I'm going to light you up like a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. Okay? That was the real reason why I got into it was when I saw what happened with the Black College Sports Network, which I don't know. I just knew that these black... <laughs> like that, right? I knew that these black colleges were going to benefit and these black kids were going to get the education that they deserved and not have to pay. The Creole seasoning is a sodium-free and sugar-free blend that's versatile enough to put on anything. One of the first blends I developed more than eight years ago, the Creole seasoning has an unmistakable aroma, a bold flavor, and a little heat for character. Every time I open one of these bottles, I hear trumpets and big band music. <laughs> This December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC versus SWAC. Champion versus champion. Only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. All right, AB. Let's let's transition over to the some superlatives that came out over the past week or two. We really haven't had a chance to kind of reflect on the announcements that have come out from the CIAA, the SIAC. Even the MIAC came out with their award uh, nominees. And I think we both agree the SWAC has not come out with theirs, and they still have one game left. So I wouldn't be surprised if the SWAC makes theirs either heading into this SWAC championship game or right afterwards. So I, I'll just kind of preface that, and uh, we'll just go there. So let's kind of go through these. I mean, we don't have to – you know, it's more list. I won't get too heavy into the list. And so, you know, any comments or – or thoughts you may have, feel free to, to jump in. But I'll just kind of go down the shot by shot here and start. In the CIAA, their Offensive Player of the Year, of course, Jerome Johnson from Bowie State. The Defensive Player of the Year, also from Bowie State, Dimitri Marcel. Special Teams Player of the Year, Jefferson Souza of Virginia Union. And then the the Coach of the Year, uh, head coach Damon Wilson, a buoy, um, you know, and so uh, of course we 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 pretty much know or we should know the story of Johnson, who a first year starter did not start the, the regular season. I think he came in maybe about two or three games into the season. Uh, he ended up leading the CIAA with a 170.5 pass efficiency rating which was the ninth best in Division II football. He ranked second in total offense, uh, averaging 227 yards per game. Uh, finished with 1,507 passing yards, 21 touchdowns, 62.4 completion percentage, which uh, ranking top four or better in the CIAA in all three categories. Uh, he was also the – Conference's sixth leading rusher. He had 771 rush yards. He was fourth with 11 rushing touchdowns. Uh, he, he led all CIAA quarterbacks in both statistics. And, of course, he was a part of the, the conference's leading points, uh, points offense. As Bowie State averaged 44.4 points a game. On the defensive side of the ball, Morcell, uh, he led the CIAA with nine interceptions. He returned three of them for touchdowns, which was the uh, – which both of those statistics 
were the best in Division II football. And young man is just a sophomore. So uh, he led the conference in 14 passes defended while totaling 31 tackles in 10 games. And he was a part of Bowie's defensive unit that held teams to a league-best 16.3 points per game. Uh, Jefferson Souza, he one of the nation's leading field goal kickers. He made 15 to 16 attempts along of 49. Tragically, we'll remember him for not giving, not being given an opportunity to kick a field goal in an overtime game, that Virginia State Virginia Union game. Uh, Union deciding to go with a fake field goal uh, to keep the game alive, I guess, and not give Susan an opportunity to tie it up. Uh, one of the greatest uh, coaching, I don't know if you want to call it a blunder or just decisions what of if? the year. Coaching well, yeah, what okay. if. One, of, one of the biggest what if of the 2019 season. And then, of course, there's uh, Damon Wilson uh, finished the regular season 10-0 and or 11-0 and after winning their second consecutive CIAA championship over Fayetteville State. Uh, sadly, they lost in the first round of the playoffs uh, quite unexpectedly. Uh, two other superlatives I thought worth mentioning were the uh, part of the all-rookie selections, the Offensive Rookie of the Year in the CIAA, Emmanuel Wilson, who is a rookie from Charlotte, North Carolina. He led all rookies with 1,040 rushing yards. He averaged 6.5 yards per carry, which ranked third in the conference in both categories, while he led all freshmen with 13 touchdowns, which was second best in the conference. And then the defensive rookie of the year, Mr. Jonathan Ross of Bowie State. He's a defensive lineman, finished with 34 total tackles, led all rookies with 11 tackles for loss and 4.5 sacks, finishing within the top 15 of all league leaders in both. So uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything I missed. Anything I missed or anything you were curious about as it relates to the CIAA, AD, and I'll make sure we post those on our BCSN, mybcsn.net. We'll make sure to post that, and always you can go to the CIAA's website if you're just curious to want to jump again and want to look at it ahead of us. No, no, no thoughts there, AD. So I'll move on to no, the. Uh, no, you good. You good there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, moving over to the SIAC, who announced their. Um, superlatives back on November 21st, about 10 days after the CIAA did theirs. And quarterback Slade Jarman of Fort Valley State was not only the overall player of the year in the conference, but he was offensive player of the year. Um, I, I find that interesting. This is another – last year, if you recall, in the SIAC, Ahmad Doremus was the overall MVP but the offensive player of the year, I think, went to either Santo Dunn or Michael Sims from Morehouse. It, it, it was Santo. Santo okay, Dunn. so I went to Santo. Yeah, I went to Santo Dunn. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, Fort Valley's defensive lineman, Demetrius Harris, was the defensive player of the year, along with Savannah State's punter, uh, excuse me, with their punt returner, uh, Inaj Carter, uh, who earned freshman of the year. Defensive end Demetrius Lofton of Morehouse was the newcomer of the year, and Reginald Ruffin of Miles was named the coach of the year. Now, obviously, you know, Jarman, we, we talked about the, the, the irony of having two Fort Valley State guys named to offensive and defensive player of the years as well as overall MVP, and then you let go of your coach, uh, the irony of all that can't be lost on anybody. Um, <laughs> hopefully not. Maybe, but uh, maybe he was let go because he did have the offensive and defensive player of the year and still was unable to win. Uh, do you know something? Uh, are you, are no, you, are you I'm breaking just, news. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, just I, <laughs> I'm just speculating. Okay. All right. I'll let you. I'll let you speculate. Uh, um. 
let's see, Savannah State and Fort Valley State place the uh, place the most selections on the all conference team, both of them with nine. But here's what I'm going to take issue with from the voters. And I noticed this as I got into, you know, I kind of go through position by position and especially looking at running backs and the SIC first team running backs to Rarest Saffold of Central State. Of course, he was one of the nation leaders in in uh, all-purpose yards. Running back Brett uh, Sylvie of Kentucky State, a redshirt junior. Um, Sylvie, um, I'm going to – did I pull up the statistics for the SIC? Yeah, I did. Uh, Sylvie actually was the – Leading rusher in the conference, 1,384 yards, 5.9 per carry, 12 touchdowns, okay? And he did that in 13 games. Now, number two on the list, that very same list with 1,029 yards, the only two backs to rush for over 1,000 yards in the conference, Brett Sylvie and D'Angelo Durham for Savannah State. Now, one of the issues that, that I think is pretty interesting is that when I get when you get over to the second team in the SIEC, the running backs who made the SIEC, and I and I hate to you know, hey, congratulations to these guys. I, I hate to I hate to do this, but the second team running backs are Kingston Davis of Lane, a junior from Montgomery, Alabama, and Santo Dunn, the junior uh, from uh, from Morehouse. And when you go and statistically look, and this is where I don't know what people were looking at, and I'm I, we're not voters, so I I can't I can't imagine. But Santo Dunn ranked 13th in rushing yards, uh, 321 this year. wasn't the wasn't the Santo Dunn year that he had previously. Uh, Kingston Davis. Uh, 247 in five games played. You know, he only played in five games. Uh, it, very odd that that somebody like D'Angelo Durham or a McKinley Habersham, Tracy Scott, those guys did not receive any first or second team recognition at the running back position in the SIEC. I just, I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know. We that's something to something for it to look at it in another day, AD. But I, I just found that really, really shocking and interesting that one of your two thousand yard running backs did not make the cut, according to the people who voted. So, and I believe uh, in the SIC, that's the coaches and the SIDs who do the yes, work. yeah, yeah. So I. I don't know what that was all about, but I, that's just shocking. Uh, the two quarterbacks, of course, we mentioned Slade Jarman and also Charles Stafford of Clark Atlanta. Um, he was, you know, second team all uh, SIC. And the last, the last conference, last but definitely not least, is the MIAC. Uh, they announced theirs on the 26th of November, maybe just ahead of Thanksgiving. Uh, now they note out they note that Florida A&M and North Carolina A&T led the way in all MEAC voting, football voting. Uh, FAMU had six, A&T had four um, two players on the first team. Now, that's just players on the first team, um, but. As it relates to – now, the MEAC does this thing where they do, like, an offensive lineman of the year, uh, an offensive player of the year, defensive player of the year, coach of the year, rookie of the year. Okay, so the offensive lineman of the year was Marcus Pettiford, the uh, offensive lineman from North Carolina a uh, Of course, you know, their line yielded the only 1,000-yard rusher in the conference in Jamie Martin. Uh, Corey Fields was the rookie of the year from South Carolina State. Makes for an interesting discussion, A.D., uh, between Corey Fields 
And uh, who was the other young man who was a sophomore? Ah, his name escapes me right at the moment from South Carolina State. Anyway, we'll we'll come back to it. Um, I, I just named the CC right at the moment. But Corey Steele, you know, it'll be interesting to see which route which route coaches go. Um, you know, and, and will Buddy Pew be back next year? I mean, Buddy Pew awarded the Coach of the Year award to to the chagrin or the disbelief of many people, uh, many fans of uh, the Rattlers, who, who I guess they thought uh, Willie Simmons should have been up for player or coach of the year. Uh, any, what are your thoughts on just uh, Buddy Pugh, you know, being recognized as coach of the year? I, I think that it's possibly a going away present. You know, he was supposed mm-hmm. to have retired and came back. He mm-hmm. he came back. I mean, co co conference uh, representative. You know, we won't we won't call them champions. A co-conference representative, and he did have a tremendous year. I'm not sure he had a better year than Coach Simmons at Florida a and I'm not, not saying that because I am a little bit biased, but I really, I really don't think that he had a a a better year. I think. I think that may be more of Coach Simmons will have the opportunity to win one again. Let's give Buddy one on his way out. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I can get with that. I can understand that. Uh, now, one of the things that I didn't see in this release from the conference, I didn't see an offensive or defensive player of the year. And so I guess this is something you and I can maybe debate on. Um, I think there are a couple of clear candidates for your offensive player of the year in the MEAC. Uh, obviously, you have Jamey Martin of North Carolina A&T. You have Ryan Stanley of uh, Florida A&M. Uh, I'm trying to think, is there anybody else who I would put in the discussion for offensive player of the year? Possibly, possibly Xavier Smith, wide receiver from Florida A&M. Um. Uh, Possibly Williams down at uh, Bethune, quarterback at Bethune. Kevious Williams. Kevious Williams, yeah, yeah, definitely probably should be up for some consideration. I guess when you go and look statistically, I, you know, I, I think it does come down to Stanley versus Martin. Um, if you had, if you had a vote for offensive player of the year in the MEAC, who would you give it to? That's not a fair question, Brian. Oh, come on, I'm asking you to be impartial. <laughs> I mean, he 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 said uh, every record that there was at at FAMU for the quarterbacks, and he was the best quarterback in the conference once uh, Kayla Newton decided to redshirt the remainder of this year. I I would have to go with Warren Stanley. You would go Stanley as your as your player of the year. Yes, offensive player of the year. Yes. Okay. Interesting. I uh, I'm a bit torn on this one because Martin led the led the conference in and touchdowns. Uh, he had 21 total touchdowns. All of them were rushing. Uh, scoring uh, led the league in scoring um, with those 21 touchdowns. Um, Total offense, you know, Martin did – he didn't do very much in terms of receiving from the backfield. And I think that's something that I'd like to see him become in the future. But I would I would give it to Martin, man. I, I just and, – and maybe I'm biased because Stanley had a poor game in his last game. You know, I, I thought, he, you know, Three three turnovers credit to his name is not how you want to close the book on your career, um, and I and I I don't know. So yeah, I, but I, also I Brian, go that for yeah. take the head to head matchup between these two, and Stanley yeah. performed better in the well. They don't they don't play on the opposite sides of the ball, but when their two teams played against each other. 
Stanley had the better game. Okay, but like you said, neither one of them really, you know, play play against each other or even play similar positions. So it's not like you're comparing Ryan Stanley to, say, um, another quarterback, which would be uh, Jawan Carter. You know, it's not like you're comparing him, you know, apples and apples. You know, so it's – it is what it is, but I I think uh, now a uh, more interesting question, AD, is defensive player of the year, and some of the names that I came across that I thought were interesting is now Rico Kennedy is a name because of some of the national recognition. Uh, Rico Kennedy, who I believe finished with 105 total tackles, 59 of them were solo. Uh, he had four and a half sacks, and then the other. The other young man would be Darius Royster. The defensive end had 75 tackles, 44 solo, nine sacks. And Royster and his nine sacks tied for the lead in the conference. Uh, In terms of tackles for loss, he and Rico Kennedy both tied with 16. Um, Let's see. Excuse me, as I pass through one of the one of the optimal locations. Um, I can't. Uh, oh, fumbles forced. Royster led the conference in fumbles forced. I don't know. Dude, Foist, I mean, uh, Darius Royster was was just an impact player all over the field. I mean, Rico Kennedy. Obviously, statistically and even nationally, uh, received the more or more praise. But if I had to, if I had to go defensive player of the year in the MEAC, I would go uh, Royster. Any, any thoughts by you? No, I, I concur with your uh, evaluation right there, Brian. All right, all right. So uh, we'll we'll sit back and we'll kind of wait to see who comes out of the pile. Uh, or who comes out of the uh, of the uh, SWAC? I shouldn't call it the pile, but who comes out for the uh, SWAC uh, championship? And like I said, either it'll be this week leading into the championship or the week after. One final superlatives list that I had to mention, AD, actually two. I mentioned last week the Harlan Hill Award, which for those of you who aren't familiar, the Harlan Hill is essentially goes to the top Division II college football player of the year. And the way it's done is they base they, it's they the D2 base, Heisman. Okay, it's the D2 Heisman. Um, and so they basically come up with a list of nominees from every region. And so they start with a list of 36 names from the four regions, uh, 10 of the 36 nominees came from Super Region 1. Sadly, only four of the 36 came from Super Region 2, which is where the CIAA and the SIC teams are. Uh, Ten players came from Super Regional 3 and 12 from Super Regional 4. Um, you can only imagine that there were no HBCU players that exist from Regional 2 that made the 32. However, we do have one from Region 1, and that is quarterback Austin Hensley from West Virginia State. And then we have uh, Hosea Franklin from out of Region 3 from Lincoln Kennedy, uh, Lincoln, not Lincoln Kennedy, Lincoln, Missouri, uh, which he was recognized from out of region one. And so the voting will take, will begin tomorrow. Uh, we're recording this on a Sunday evening, uh, the first of the month. So sometime Monday or Tuesday, the first Monday of the new month, they will narrow down this list of 36 names. And they'll do so, I believe, by selecting. I uh, just want to look at the criteria here and make sure I say this right. Um, so the 36 initial candidates are placed on regional ballots 
and the top two players from each of the four regions advance to the national ballot um, when regional voting concludes on Monday, December 2nd. So voting concludes tomorrow, and from out of this, you'll get two from each region. Now, can you imagine that there were only four names selected from out of Region 2? And so, essentially, everybody who's the four people there have a 50-50 shot of making it, where Austin Hensley in Region 1 is one of 10 players, and I think Hosea Franklin is also one of 10 players. So, uh, I don't know. Any, Any thoughts on the Harlem Hill there, AD. No, let's just this is hope that one of our two HBCU candidates gets an opportunity to get in. You know, uh, uh, Franklin from uh, from from Lincoln, Missouri. You know, he was the bright spot on a bad team. There's no better way to put it. And then. Uh, from West from West Virginia State, we've got a good player on a on a good team, but in a tough region. Mm-hmm. So it, it it is what it is. But uh, let's just hope let's just hope at least one of these two guys uh, get in there and get an opportunity to make it for our uh, for our, and then represent our HBCUs at their prestigious award. And the last thing I wanted to bring up had to do with the finalists for the 2019 Stats FCS, what they call the Legacy Awards, which essentially are the uh, Walter Payton Award, the Buck Buchanan Award, the Jerry Rice Award, and the Eddie Robinson Award. Uh, As you can imagine, the Eddie Robinson Award is for the top top coach of the year, the uh, Jerry Rice Award, uh, I believe goes to the top newcomer of the conference or of of the uh, of D2. Uh, just looking up here. Uh, Jerry Rice Award is the FCS Freshman Player of the Year. So it only goes to the Freshman Player of the Year. So the Buck Buchanan Award goes to the FCS Defensive Player of the Year and there are only two HBC players recognized on this list, and they are Rico Kennedy uh, of Morgan State, the linebacker, and Solomon, Solomon Muhammad, the linebacker from Alcorn State. Those are the two defensive guys. And then as we get to the, you know, everyone loves offense, so you got to get to the offensive player of the year, the Walter Payton Award, and there are four I thought I counted five, but there were four HBCU players in the mix. There is Jordan Bentley of Alabama A&M, the running back who ran for about 1,300 yards this year. You've got Felix Harper, the quarterback from Alcorn State. Uh, Just video game numbers that he's putting up lately. Um, Jamaine Martin from North Carolina (coughs) A&T. mentioned him earlier. How about Chris Rowland from Tennessee State? Uh, should be an should be an odds on favorite to win this thing, to be honest with you. When you look at his total all purpose yards, twenty one hundred, when you take a look at uh what he has done this past season, leading the nation in all purpose yards, receiving yards, receiving yard average, uh and, and then what he did in taking care uh, of his team, even on off days. I mean, my goodness, when he when he didn't even play, uh, he took care of his team as a holder. Chris Rowland, a ridiculous uh, season. And oh, did I even mention the fact that he set the hundred with 104 receptions that he set the single season record that was once held by Jerry Rice? Did I mention that? Probably not. We were first, we were first to mention it on this show. A week, a week <laughs> right. and a half ago. We tracked it. We were first to track it. If nothing else. Yeah, and then also on that list, Ryan Stanley, uh, FAMU's quarterback, made the finalist list as well for the Walter Payton Award. So all of those uh, awards will be 
<clears throat> voted on January 10th in Frisco, Texas, as part of the national championship game in FCS. Stats will have an awards banquet and presentation. Somehow we got to find our way to that, A.D. How about that? You want to make your way to Frisco, Texas on January 10th? First of all, you got to Google and tell me where Frisco, Texas is at, Brian, before I tell you if I want to make my way to it. This December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC versus SWAC. Champion versus champion. Only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. Q-Time is our classic Atlanta soul food restaurant located in the historic West End. Q-Time Soul Food is a family business started by Fred and Christine Crenshaw. Come on in, relax, and sink your chops into our tantalizing, mouth-watering, distinctive soul food with a twist, the Q-Time way. 1120 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard, or call your order in at 404-758-2881. Do you miss your mama's cooking? Then come on down to Q-Time, an Urban Passport member. It's like a loop machine. Sounds good. Okay. Well, it's that time. A new segment debuting, and I'm sure we'll do this at least once a week. It's time for AD's Dimes, as AD will hit us with a 10 piece of some of the best news from the early part of the HBCU basketball season. Straight from the mind of AD Drew giving a shout-out to all the men's and women's programs uh, in black college basketball. I get used to saying black college basketball now. Uh, I'm so used to just naturally rolling off with football. So, all right, A.B., I'm going to turn it over to you right now and uh, give us your dimes. All right, Brian. Uh, and and why, why are we calling this segment uh, Drew's Dimes, Brian? because I've got 10 points that I want to bring out with basketball. Some of them may help somebody out. Some of them may help just our listeners out, just giving them some news and some notes that, uh, that, that they, uh, that they may be interested in. And we've got about a month's worth of dimes to go, Brian. So we're going to, we're going to try to get in, get out. We we'll hit on a couple of points on some of those, and then some of them we'll just mention and move on. The first one I want to start off with is uh, this. This goes back to the preseason. Uh, Shaw Shaw University announced the resignation of their head coach on uh, October fifteenth, which is traditionally the day that. Uh, that colleges start practicing uh, basketball. Yeah, there are some waivers that you can get uh, 30 days before your first game, but if not, October 15th is the day. And uh, head coach of the Shaw Bears, uh, Hopkins, Hopkins, uh, can't remember, can't, Joel Hopkins, excuse me, Coach Joel Hopkins uh, announced his uh, – his resignation, right, right as practice was beginning, getting ready to begin, and that's got to be a that's a double-edged sword right there. Uh, interim coach Do, Dominique Stevens has taken over the uh, the game. Uh, excuse me, the team. Number one, obviously, you want to hope that it was not for health reasons. They did not say they did not give a specific reason uh, for it. I do. I was actually a part of this happening uh, when I was at Tuskegee when uh, the women's coach, Belinda Roby, at that point in time, left the team preseason uh, just before the uh, regular season began. And sometimes coaches will do that so that 
they can set up their assistant to take over the team. They because this, obviously the school does not have enough time to go through a national search at that point in time. So that coach gets a that assistant coach gets a year to build up his resume and to build a program and make it and make it into his own. Which I hope is the case here that when uh, Coach Hopkins decided to move on, that he did this so that he could uh, leave it for his. Uh, for his, for his assistant, but this but this Shaw Bears team uh, it came came in uh, with with some real national uh, national recognition. Uh, three straight CIAA South titles, uh, twenty win season in the twenty seventeen twenty eighteen. Year so this at this team is is supposed to be a a good team, Brian. So we just hope that with the, and it looks like the Shaw Bears are doing that they're off to a decent start. So we just hope that it did not affect the young men there at uh, Shaw University that much. Anything on that before I move on to my next one, Brian? No, sir. Keep them rolling. Okay, so uh, we're we're staying the CIAA with with our dives right now. Fayetteville Broncos, their men are off to a seven and zero start on the young season, Brian, and uh, j- j- just a tremendous start on 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 the young season, Brian. Uh, they're not ranked yet nationally, but the fact they're able to get off to a seven and zero start is. Uh, it, it, it's excellent. There's, there's no better way to put that, Brian. Anytime you're seven and zero, seven and zero is seven and zero. You're putting the ball in the hole more time to, than the uh, other teams. Uh, staying, staying on the East Coast, moving over to the uh, Division One team in, on the East Coast. Bethune Cookman is off to a five and two start. Their men's program, Brian. Uh, in in the BX, so uh, kudos to Bethune Cookman for getting off to such a fast start. But Brian, speaking of fast starts, how about this? On November thirteenth, Norfolk State, the Spartans of Norfolk State, hit. Do, do do you know how many threes they hit in this game, Brian? Can can you just just give me a guess, Brian? Fifteen. Keep going. Whoa, 25. 23s, 20. Okay. They hit 23s and tied their own Division One school record. And when I say Division One school record, that is since Norfolk State has become a Division One program in a 113-54 victory. Now, I've never heard of the school that they played, Brian, but – Twenty threes is twenty threes, no matter who you're playing, Brian. They they play a thing called the Apprentice School. So uh, just just kudos to that. I mean, talk about talk about a team being hot, Brian. Twenty threes is twenty threes. Uh, continuing to to move on. Uh, Sand on the East Coast. Ever Waters women, Brian, and we've had a, a chance to cover a game or two for them. They're off to an eight and one start, Brian. Eight and one after finishing runner up in the GCAC last year. Coach Charmaine Wilson has her team off to eight and one start. You know who that one loss was to, Brian? No. A Division One Bethune Cookman. Is the only loss uh, of the season, Brian? Defending me at champs, Bethune Cookman. That's my point, Brian. So, kudos to the uh, kudos, kudos to the Tigers from uh, from Everwaters, and get, getting down to dime number five, Brian. This this is a this will happen in in exhibition season, but a W over a Division One team is a W over a Division One team. Tuskegee women uh, stunned everybody by beating Georgia State in a, in an in an exhibition game, 
earlier this season. They won by a score of 78 to 73 back back in uh back in October, Brian. So uh Tuskegee Tuskegee women after winning the regular season title last year, uh upset in the SIAC tournament, but they're off to a 3 and 2 start on the season thus far, but they defeated a major division 1 program, a Sunbelt team, Georgia State. We're at the halfway point of our dimes, Brian. Uh, Going to give you the opportunity to get any comments on those first five dimes that I've dropped. Oh, no, A.D., look, Jay, this is your segment. This is your time. Remember, you with, with, with the dimes, the dimes are on you. I mean, I, I don't have any, uh, you know, the, the, few, the few things that I, that I do see and come across I send to you, uh, you know, maybe with a little more show prep, I will be able to uh, kind of jump in on these. But uh, I, I, I turn this this over to you. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Brian, it seems like, like the SWAC just can't get it right. You know, we, we've talked about SWAC football and how they're in football when they play other – conferences they just do not win well brian it's carried over to basketball currently as we're recording this show there are no swack teams men or women with a winning record brian no team in in, in men's basketball or win, women's basketball is over 500 brian you've got a you've got three and three team you got a three and three team on the men's side and Grambling is three and three uh, in, in men's in men's play, and on the and on the women's side, Brian, you've got Alabama State sitting at three and three. Those are your leaders in your conference thus far this season, Brian. You know, it's it's, it's, it's just baffling that you know no, normally you go and you play a couple of teams that can get you over the hump get you some confidence but seems like the swack is not able to has not been able to do it but there is a bright point for for swack for the swack Brian this past saturday the swack went 3 and 0 against some division 1 teams those teams were texas southern won 76 73 over labar Alabama State won 67-54 over Chicago State. Prairie View A&M won 79-72 over UT San Antonio. And here's the one, here's the stat of the day, Brian. This is not a Division One team, but still, Mississippi Valley State on Saturday won. Listen to this score, Brian. One twenty-four to seventy. Let me repeat Whoa. that. One twenty-four to seventy. I've seen a lot of basketball. I've been in a lot of basketball games. I've never seen one hundred and twenty-four points by one team. I've never. I've rarely seen one hundred and ninety-four points combined, Brian. Sounds like uh, sounds like somebody should say, "Keep living." Yeah, uh, Tennessee State coming off of a ended an eight game road stand, and can you imagine an eight game road stand, Brian, as a as a coach? That's got to be hell. But they did win the Continental Tire Las Vegas International Title by beating University of North Florida eighty one. 73. So they came back with some hardware after going uh, after that long road stand, Brian. Uh, and 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 I'm bouncing off, I'm bouncing over my notes right here because I, I did not put them in order. We hit Norfolk State. We hit but the women. Let's go. Let's go to NAIA for our last time, Brian. We've got three men's teams ranked in the top 25 in NAIA as as of the latest poll on last week. Those three teams are number eight, Talladega, number 14, Stillman, and number 22, Wiley College, Brian. 
just finishing outside of the t- the top 25 uh, with receiving votes, Xavier, who would have been 28 by the number of votes they got, and Dillard would have been number 30 based on based on the number of votes and points that they received. Brian, those are my 10 points in reference to college basketball, HBCU style right now, or as we like to call them, Drew's Knives, Brian. And are we sure we hit 10? I'll take your word on it. I'm just messing with you. But, yes. you know, the people, the people, if we didn't hit 10, we will hear about it. <laughs> so, 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 some of them, some of them were quick though. But yes, I, because, because I, I, I did do a good uh, job of numbering my notes, Brian. <laughs> once, once All right. Then. <laughs> any, any of those dimes that you miss, we will make sure to put up on our web website, uh, mybcsn.net, dot net, and we'll also retweet the links on those dimes. So, uh, sometime, sometime Monday, those should be up. On our website, AD is going to, you know, he's already going to, I think you've already done it, but we'll we'll have all the information up and available uh, to see. So, uh, all right, well, hey, that that was a good little kickoff for the Black College basketball season. Uh, Look forward to talking more about the teams, um, some of the, some of the current, you know, some of the just, it's just a different environment. I think I think right now is trying to transition from – I mean, we both know basketball very well, having coached it at various levels. But now just having to sort of a turn, of our, turn our attention and find out what do people like to hear? What do they want to know about basketball, black college basketball, the black colleges, and, and, and just, uh, you know, try to find some interesting discussions and topics and, and things like that to uh, to speak on as it relates to uh, these teams and games. So uh, good job, A.D. Appreciate your work. Appreciate your time and efforts. Um, want to remind you to uh, give us a shout on Twitter. Uh, if you like A.D.'s Dimes, hit them up at BCSN Drew, D-R-E-W. You can also find me at DRB365 on Twitter. Um, the Black College Sports Network is accessible on Twitter and Instagram. Find us at my bcsn1 the number one and of course use that same username to find our facebook page uh as well as our hbcu uh, our bcsn sports wrap and of course www.mybcsn.net all right ad i think that's going to do it for this episode man i know we uh back to work for everybody out there so uh you know you're you're long if you had a long week off I hope you enjoyed it because it's back to reality. Uh, the good thing is, AD, we can start counting down to Christmas, 24 days till Christmas as of this recording. Wow. Yeah, already at the end of the year. So, uh, yep, we're, we're getting there. We're a lot closer. So, uh, all right, well, that's going to do it for this show. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Please share it with a couple of friends. Let them know about us. We appreciate you. Reach out when you can. Uh, For A.D. Drew, I'm Brian Fulford. Thanks for listening and watching our uh, BCSN Sports Wrap. And that is it. Peace out. Ha-ha-la. December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC versus SWAC. 
champion versus champion. Only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com.